So I'm here on a South Australian beach. I don't have internet access on my phone, but I do have it thanks to Starlink, which is a satellite-based system for internet access pretty much anywhere in the world. Now in this video, I'm going to be explaining what Starlink is, how it works, and also the experience I've had using it in a few different locations in Australia. And the idea there is to see whether it could be a solution for you as someone who travels Australia or the world and you want internet access in places that you've never had it before. So this video is about Starlink for remote travelers, but before I get into that, I want to put it in context with some of the other internet access options that you have. And the first one is, of course, typically your mobile phone. You could simply create a hotspot off that and then you have internet access. But that requires, of course, the fact that you have mobile phone coverage and the phone isn't really designed to be a hotspot for long periods of time and the coverage um, from Wi-Fi isn't all that great. So that's when something like this can start to be useful, which is a dedicated Wi-Fi router modem. Um, this is a Netgear Nighthawk and it's mine and I can charge it and it will just last for an entire day on a battery power which is great. The Wi-Fi range is pretty good and also you can raise it up pretty high as well and then just leave it out of the way and the higher you have anything talking radio waves um, like a, a 4G access system the better coverage you're going to get, whereas you might not want to take your phone out of your hand and put it on the roof of your caravan or hoist it up on top of a sand flag or something like that. And the other thing you can do with a Nighthawk is you can connect it to an external antenna like that. So this antenna goes into the two antenna ports here. And um, this is a directional antenna. You can point it where the signal is coming from and you can obviously hoist that further up. I've actually put it on a camera uh, a tripod mount but you can obviously put it on a pole or whatever else there so that's another option but it does require you to be somewhere vaguely um, within range of cellular signal. Now the other thing I want to make really clear is that Starlink and in, is not in any way shape or form a substitute for something like a satellite phone or a distress beacon or satellite messenger. Uh, the reason is that in order to set up Starlink you're going to need a power source, it's big and it's bulky, it's going to take three or four minutes to set up um, and it's not really very robust. Whereas this satellite phone the battery will last a long time, you can text, you can call, um, it's very easy to use, it's, it's very bushable, you could drop it on the ground, it still works, it's largely waterproof. So the, the satellite phone is very much complementary to Starlink and shouldn't be seen as one replacing all the other. Now you may see that this Iridium st um, sat phone does have internet access and it kind of does, but really it's basically unusable, it's really expensive. If you want internet access, then something like Starlink is a much better bet. So Starlink's a pure ISP or internet service provider just providing internet access and absolutely nothing else. So most of the ISPs will give you a free email address, they'll offer services over the top with Starlink, you don't get any of that pure internet access. But with that internet access you can do anything you'd normally do. You can browse the web, you can watch Netflix, um, Hulu, Binge, all of the streaming services there. That's all you get pure internet access and I kind of, kind of like that pure approach. So how fast is Starlink? Well, according to a website which collects data from around the world of Starlink users, the average is 143 megabits, which is very much faster than the average speed of the internet in Australia. Now, what I'm doing here is I have set um, Starlink up on a beach in South Australia, and I'm running a speed test, same as you can do on any internet access system. You can see that it's just gone past the 200 mark, and gives me a download speed of 201 megabits. So let's see what the upload speed is like and then I'm going to show you what um, where the Starlink system is actually set up. Okay, so we have there a download of 201, which is pretty quick, upload of 34, not exactly shabby. And this is where we're at. We are somewhere where my mobile phone does not work, but I just took Starlink out, there's Dishy, set it up on the beach, and we are good to go for high-speed internet access. Up there, there's thousands of satellites sending and receiving data, and it's just me and the seagulls. 
Now for this test I'm at home and I have one phone connected to my Telstra NBN and the other phone connected to Starlink and as you see I press start on the same speed test at exactly the same time so let's see which is quicker. So you can see that Starlink is up to about 2.25 and the NBN is 22. 0.5 so not exactly an impressive showing for the wired national broadband network compared to the satellite based Starlink so this is why a lot of people are cancelling their NBN and their Optus and their Telstra and just relying on Starlink but we're really here to talk about travel not fixed location internet access so this is how it works then we've got the dish and attached to the dish is um, a long cable, an ethernet cable. This disc only connects at one end. On this particular dish, and we call this dishy, then it is permanently connected to, to the dishy. That goes into the control box here, so that's the grey cable that goes into the, the grey side there. And then we have our standard ethernet cable here, that, that's white handily, that plugs into the white side. And then that plugs in to this side here. And then you've just got a standard power cable that plugs into the back there. You plug that in to the wall and that's basically it. Now all you've got to do is ensure that your dishy has a clear view of the satellites and that means exactly what you'd think. So putting it in the middle of a valley is probably not a good idea or right next to a house. You want to raise it as high as you can and in the southern hemisphere make sure that it's got a good view of the satellites over to the south. Now the Starlink app which you can run on your phone will give you some guidance as to whether or not there are obstructions and allow you to move it around. I found that pretty much is putting it on the ground in my garden and where if I'm out traveling seems to work pretty well but I'm um, obviously if you can raise it higher then you should do as well. Now I'm not going to turn this into a technical explanation of exactly how Starlink works but in short this um, dish, the dishy, will send and receive internet data to satellites and at the moment there are, well they keep launching more of them but probably about 2,000 satellites orbiting the earth. Now to put that um, to do with Starlink, to put that in perspective Mankind has launched in total about 12,000 satellites since humanity started putting stuff in space, of which a bit under 5,000 are still there. And we've got two or 3,000 um, of the Starlink satellites up there already with plans to go to 42,000 in total. And these satellites are orbiting at a lower elevation above the Earth than is normally the case. So the distance from Dishy to the satellite is a lot lower than, than uh, a lot shorter than it would normally be. And then the satellites can will be able to talk to each other at the speed of light and then send data down to many ground stations around the Earth, which are plumbed kind of directly into the background of the internet. So that's how they can achieve those super high speeds. Now there's a bunch of philosophical questions around Starlink, such as um, should one company be allowed to put that many satellites up there and, um, and space junk and uh, effects of internet access for the whole world. I'm not going to explore that. I'm just going to explain the practicalities of it for someone looking to do vehicle-based travel in Australia and around the world. Now when you're travelling remotely you're also going to need to provide power to Starlink and obviously there's no main socket to plug it into which means you're going to need something called an inverter which takes your vehicle's 12 or 24 volt um, DC power supply and converts that into 240 volt AC so you can indeed plug it in. Now there's two types of inverters, there's modified sine wave and there is pure sine wave. This is a modified sine wave one which isn't actually marked as such, it's a thousand watts hence it's pretty large. This is a pure sine wave uh, version which is 400 watts and this is the one which I use, it doesn't work, um, I've tried styling on this one, uh, it doesn't work. And the current draw written on the control box is maximum of 180 watts which is well below the 400 here um, but when it's running it's more like about 100 watts and potentially even less than that so I find that it works pretty well with a 400 watt um, pure sine wave inverter. There's a couple of caveats to that um, though and the first one is that um, 
the inverter probably needs a fair bit of voltage in order to generate the current uh, required and quality current required for Starlink because what I found is you can actually take this and plug it into a cigarette lighter um, but the voltage drop is such that the inverter um, doesn't work to the standard required for Starlink so just connecting it directly to the battery does work or I could just run the engine um, and then that will just increase the voltage slightly on the cigarette lighter. So my advice for setting up this kit is pretty much the same as anything you take traveling. Get it working at home first, get it all sorted out, plug it into the mains. Once you've done that, then take your inverter um, and then or generate whatever you're going to use and then use that so then you're basically eliminating variables as opposed to trying to get it out in the field you're not sure if you've set it up correctly um, or the power supply is out whatever the case may be but it is sensitive to the quality of the power supply another tip when you're setting this up out in the field is that there are three lights um, for diagnostics there's one on the wi-fi modem router here and there's one each here. These are not really helpful because they can be illuminated yet the Starlink cannot actually work. So you can actually see that, that, that there's power there but you'll get that even if you plug it into a modified sine wave inverter um, the lights will come on and you think oh it's okay but it's but it's not. So really relying on these lights there they, they should be a lot more informative. Now there are diagnostic ways to look at it. You can run the app, um, you can go you can run a web browser and go to or on your phone or on a PC and go to 192.168.100.1 but sometimes the Wi-Fi won't even come up let alone the internet access um, and if that's the case it's almost always going to be some form of power supply issue. Now at the moment with Starlink you have to select where you're going to use it. So you have to go into your Starlink account and say where your service address is before you get there. So for example when I travelled to New South Wales before I left I set my service address to the location where I was staying and I got Starlink out and it worked. Now that is obviously a limitation of the system because if you're traveling around somewhere you need internet access to in order to set your, your service address but then how do you get internet access unless you've actually got it? Well um, Starlink working well there's a couple of different ways you could do it. You could phone someone who does have internet access using your sat phone or more likely you'll go somewhere where there is internet access off your 4G phone or whatever else, set it and then you'll go out into the bush um, and then you'll use Starlink there. So that's just a limitation of the system to be aware of. Now something else is that if you use Starlink at home as your primary internet system, um, as, as I do in fact, and then you go away travelling and you set your service address somewhere else, when you come back you might find that there is no more capacity in your cell and you're unable to set your Starlink address back to your home. Now that hasn't happened to me yet nor anyone I know but it is a risk if you are considering using Starlink as your permanent home connection as well as taking it away when you travel. So when you have everything set up how long does it actually take? Well from when you plug everything in and put power into the system my experience is that if you've got everything set up such as your address etc it should take less than five minutes from powering the Starlink system on to when you have internet access and if it takes more than let's say about 10 then something's wrong with the power supply or obstructions or your address details or whatever else now you've got to troubleshoot and again the lights are really not that useful for troubleshooting. So this is the Starlink portal you access off a web browser and I'm going to go in and change the service address and for that you can just basically zoom in and out a map of the entire world. I just moved out a bit here so you can see Australia and now I'm going to zoom into where I want and you can see that the update address is greyed out at the moment and that's going to stay greyed out until you zoom in quite a long way. That's a tip, that's a trip, trip which I'm actually caught me out and now I've zoomed in far enough, now I can hit update address. So I've hit update address and it says, sorry, we're not actually providing service in that area at the moment because as I said, Starlink is not completely world or Australia wide yet. So we're going to zoom out again. We're going to go to somewhere where I know we can get service and demonstrate that. Now you can just type in any address that you would normally to you know enter an address for shipping something to your home or whatever else, or for travelers, you often don't want to do that you want to select a point on a map and that's what I'm doing here so I'm basically just selecting a random point I'm just going to keep zooming in and now as you can see I've zoomed in far enough that update address button becomes active you can click on update address and there you go the address is now updated and will work for Starlink when I move there.
Now, I'm pretty sure the world leader for changing and in fact using and figuring out Starlink is Marcus Tuck. You can look at his stuff over at tuckstruck.net. He has changed his address over 100 times and he has used Starlink in Canada and the USA. He had to sell his Canada kit before he could buy a well to buy a USA kit. Um, so this address changing here and there does work. I've changed addresses probably 10 times in 10 different locations and it's been no drama for me. Um, from the time when you put the address change in to when it takes effect is only about a couple of minutes. So as far as bushability and robustness is concerned, uh, look, these RJ45 connectors are not going to last um, forever. It is big and bulky, it's somewhat fragile, um, it, it's picky about its power supply. I can't really fault Starlink for that because it is not designed for what I'm trying to do with it. They are bringing out a mobile version, but bear in mind this is not as robust as something like a sat phone and you will need to take care of it. Now, where does uh, your dishy work? Well, eventually it will be worldwide, but at the moment it's not worldwide and it's not even Australia wide. You can look up and I'll put links up as to where you can see the current coverage there, but they are rapidly expanding coverage and they will get to the entire world. But right at the moment, you can't go absolutely everywhere and expect Starlink internet access. Starlink is not designed as a portable system. It is designed to be put into one place, fixed there and then used. But I am using it as a portable system, as are other people. So I'm going to talk about some of the practicalities around that. The first one is size. This is not a particularly small unit. Um, and to give you an idea, that's where the dishy goes. That's how I tend to carry it I'm in my caravan in the back of the ute. Um, I would suggest that if you don't have a ute with a service body or a trailer of some description, you're going to be hard pressed to find space to carry the dishy. That, that's the first limitation, actually, space. And it's not super light. Um, it, it weighs around sort of 13 kilograms for the lot there. Now, there is a um, lighter and smaller version of it, which is available in the United States, but not yet in Australia. Hopefully, that will come out soon. And Starlink have stated that they will be creating a mobile system um, which is for mo mobile users. That's your first limitation. So, is Starlink right for you? Well, the first question is cost. You're looking at a bit over $800 for the Starlink kit itself, and then $140 per month ongoing, and, but that will get you very high speed internet anywhere within service coverage, and that's increasing. And there is no speed restriction, nor there is there any data cap, but Starlink have not guaranteed that will remain into the future. Now, cost is the first consideration. Then the second is, do you actually have the space to carry the Starlink kit and to set it up? Um, because not everyone will have that sort of space in their traveling vehicle. Though if you've got a truck or a trailer, large you, you should be um, okay. Then do you actually need it? If you're not really going into remote areas, often you are able just to simply rely on something like um, 4G off this um, night gear uh, modem router or just your phone's um, hotspot or something similar. But if you are going into areas where internet access is limited or non-existent and you do need it, for example, like me, you work from um, home or, or a caravan, or uh, you're homeschooling kids, you're doing a big lap or whatever the case may be, then there's really no alternative to Starlink at the moment. And certainly the data plan you get off a sat phone is just nothing in comparison. Uh, but do remember that Starlink is not an emergency remote communication system. If you are in trouble in remote areas, you're really not going to be setting Starlink up to get help. This is where you want something like a distress beacon or um, a satellite phone like this one. And I've explain more about emergency remote communication options in another video. So how usable is Starlink? Well, a lot of people have set it up and thought, okay, should I cancel my Telstra Optus service? And then after a few days, couple of weeks to go, yeah, actually, it is faster, it's equally as reliable, it's good enough, and they gleefully cancel their normal service. So it does work. And my experience is that once you've got everything set up, the, the, it's got an obstruction fee view of the sky, then it's great. Is it absolutely perfect? No, there is the occasional dropout, atmospheric conditions in the troposphere, etc., can affect it. But to be honest, um, that's really no worse than my fixed NBN internet access. So I'd be perfectly happy using this as your permanent internet connection, no worries at all. Now, the other thing to say is that uh, Starlink is constantly being updated. They're updating the app, they're launching more and more satellites, they're updating the firmware on Dishy. It's just improving time and time and time and time again. So you're kind of buying into a system which is only going to get better and it's pretty damn good at the moment. 
So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the comments and please consider supporting my work on Patreon so that I can continue to do this. Thanks.